Today on Survival Guns, we're going to take a look at the Smith & Wesson Model 629, which is identical to the Model 29, except in stainless steel, the in 44 Magnum. The 44 Magnum cartridge came out in around 1955-1956, and Smith & Wesson came out with the Model 29 around the same time. Uh, Ruger actually beat them to the punch and came out with the 44 Magnum version of the Ruger Red Hawk, even before the Model 29 became available. It was called the 44 Magnum. 1957 is when uh, they actually called it the Model 29. And then the, the Model 629 came out in the 1980s and comes in a very large array of different configurations. The Model um, 29 came out in a 3-inch, 4-inch, 5-inch, 6-inch, 6 and 3 eighths. Uh, eight and three eighths, I believe, and actually at one time a uh, over ten inch barrel. I think it was ten and five eighths inch. And the model six twenty nine uh, hasn't been quite so many variations. I believe four inch, five inch, and six and a half, and an eight and three quarter. This one happens to have the um, uh, red insert front sight, an adjustable rear sight, and underneath the the front sight, the rear sight assembly, this can be removed and it's actually drilled and tapped for a scope. So a uh, great gun for hunting with the scope on there uh, for white-tailed deer, you know, medium to large uh, game for the 44 Magnum. This happens to be the 629-5. Uh, Smith & Wesson, when they come out with a major improvement or a variation, they'll uh, put a dash after the model designation. And they have so many guns available and so many dashes that the books are like two inches thick that chronicle all the variations of their guns. Uh, this is a Dash 5, which came out um, just before around nine, late 90s, 97 or so to 2001. So this was the last variation before the internal lock, um, which is located right above the cylinder latch lever right over here. There'll be like a little arrow that tells you which way to turn it. I don't particularly like the uh, lock Smith & Wesson. Some people like to put a lock on it for safety reasons. Um, but when those fail, they typically fail so that the gun doesn't fire anymore. Um, so I like the non-lock versions. But to each his own, I guess. Uh, so this was the latest variation without that lock. And so this was made in the late 1990s, and it's in, it's in great shape. Um, the double action, single action, this is a traditional double action revolver. So show clear. Look at the size of those uh, chamber holes in that cylinder. That's a big boy. It weighs in at, um, well, how much does this weigh? 44.4 ounces. And a uh, good thing because the 44 Magnum is quite a powerhouse and it uh, has uh, quite a bit of recoil. Not like the Limbaugh's and, you know, the 500 Smith and West and those are just uh, incredibly the most powerful handguns in the world. This used to be at one point, and, uh, but it's still a pretty stout round. You're looking at 750 foot-pounds, maybe more. Um, these 44 Magnums here are the Winchester uh, Platinum. 250 grain, a little bit heavy. The normal uh, weight for a 44 Magnum is 240 grain. This happens to be 250. This is great for uh, black bear or deer. And um, they're platinum tip hollow points, they call them. Just gorgeous rounds, premium. You know, for a box of uh, 25, you're looking at, uh, I don't know, probably $40, $40 or so. So almost $2 a round, a lot of places. Around 850 foot pounds in a handgun. That's going to beat you up pretty good, especially since uh, these are good Hogue rubber grips that come stocked with the gun. Really great for uh, traction and holding on to the gun. Very ergonomic, very comfortable in the hand. The only distractor of this though is that the, the back strap is exposed to the hand and it doesn't have rubber back here. So eventually I'm gonna get some uh, rubber grips that have uh, gel or something back here. Uh, maintains recoil a little bit better because on full bore, full house, 44 Magnum loads, it's not like an automatic where there's a time dwelling when the when the slide and the locking mechanism is doing its thing over time, so it kind of distributes the recoil over time. On a, since this is a fixed breech on a revolver, the, um, the recoil 
velocity from the round immediately strikes the web of the hand. So uh, it hurts a little bit. All right, so I'm going to go top down through the features. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, if you're looking at this here, there's a HKS speed loader for a Model 29. Obviously the same for a 629. Very easy to do. Open up the latch, throw in this hand. The right hand could be receiving the uh, rounds. Wiggle into place. You just um, turn it, release it, and that's it. Ready to go. All right. And then here, these are 44 specials. These are 180 grain HTPs. Uh, since this is a 44 Magnum, it could actually fire any 44 Magnum round or 44 Specials. And 44 Specials come in Plus P or uh, regular, uh, they come in Gold Dot. So between the 44 Specials and the 44 Magnum, you have quite a, a, vari a variation in um, the types of rounds that you could fire. From mild cowboy loads and 44 Special to defensive loads, 44 Special, to lighter defensive load and 44 Magnum. And then the full hunting or hard cast 44 Magnum uh, loads that you can shoot through the revolver. Okay, so let's get the ammo out of the way. Make room to describe uh, the features of the gun. This is, uh, if I didn't mention already, this is a 5 inch. A little bit unusual. 4 inches is more common and so is 6 or 6.5. And, and this is a 5 inch and the 5 inch has the full underlug. This is called the... Um, the 629 Classic, I don't know if you can see that here, but it's uh, laser engraved, kind of lightly laser engraved here. And on the left on the left side, we have Smith & Wesson, 44 Magnum, it says right here. It's got the full underlug, and it has the extractor, is totally contained. On the top strap, very nicely done where this is a matte finish to reduce glare. It's serrated here to break up any glare that's there. The front sight <clears throat> is removable. There's a pin and you could uh, put night sights or white outline or all black, whatever you want. There's all there's tons of available front sight options. The rear sight is removable as well and the rear sight is adjustable for elevation with a screw here and a screw on the side for um, windage. For your left and right. Okay, so this is a six inch. Here's the cylinder latch. This is a new style cylinder latch. It was a more of a squarish or rectangle before uh, this came out in the 90s. It's a, a wide target hammer, a wide target type trigger, but it's more of a combat trigger because there's no grooves. It's nice and smooth. And you know I like smooth triggers on a revolver, double action revolver, because when you do um, fast revolver double action shooting, uh, the grooves, in my finger anyway, tend to chew up my finger, and especially if they're sharp. So I like a smooth trigger. It's easy to move your finger and roll through the, uh, roll through the double action trigger. And it's called a double action because it's doing two things to the hammer. It's cocking the hammer and releasing the hammer. Single action guns like the Blackhawk or the Colt uh, single action army of the 1800s, you have to cock the hammer first. And that's all it does. Well, this one does both. It'll bring the next round into place and release the hammer. And for hunting and so forth, you can or target practice, long range, you can uh, cock the hammer. And then you've got a lighter, shorter trigger pull. The double action on this is very smooth. Doesn't stack. Doesn't. There's no grit, and uh, it's probably around eight and a half pounds. The uh, the single action is. No rear, there's no uh, creep, no movement, and when you put pressure on it, it just falls like a glass rod breaking. Exceptional. I'm guessing three and a half pounds. It's pretty light and uh, not dangerously so, but uh, just an exceptionally nice trigger. You notice there's no firing pin on the hammer like they did on earlier Smith & Wessons. This is just the hammer, and then there's a transfer bar for safety reasons, and then the floating firing pin in here with a, um, a spring so the inertia doesn't won't fire a round if it's dropped on its muzzle for instance <clears throat> so that's a safety feature so the the gun can't go off if the hammer is struck or if the um, 
if, a, if the hammer releases, if something breaks inside and it releases, unless the, the trigger is all the way back, like right now, the trigger, I'm not pushing on the trigger, so it can't make a round go off because the trigger has to be held all the way back for the transfer bar to allow the hammer to strike the firing pin. The cylinder locks up in the rear and in the front right here. Also the bolt is holding in this place. This freely moves really nice. The machining is exceptionally well done on this revolver. There's no wobble whatsoever. The extractor lever is just extremely smooth and I usually move it through throughout its uh, turning because sometimes it'll be a catchy spot and this is extremely smooth throughout. Smith & Wesson you can turn the, the um, extractor here and it's just going to spin with it. The crane is exceptionally smooth and by the way you don't close by throwing your wrist like you see on TV or non-gun people just take it and they just throw it like that. Very bad for a revolver. What you want to do is close it gently snap into place, gently turn it so that the bolt catches on the on the uh, bolt lat, the bolt recess here. You might get a little tiny scratching here and that's when the bolt rides on the cylinder. So this is a, a slightly shiny, it's not totally buffed out but it's a really gorgeous pistol. These are the whole grips finger groove with the pebbling that comes with the revolver. Take a look at that there. This is what's called the crane, this area right here where the, where the cylinder moves on it. You can see that moving here, that's the crane. And what you want to see in a revolver is you want to see the crane have just a seam there with not too much of a gap in there. This crane looks pretty darn good. Because if it's all open or whatever, there's a problem with the crane. Also, there shouldn't be too much lateral movement this way or front to back. And this is extremely tight, like a bank vault, maybe not quite like what a uh, Ruger Red Hawk might be, but it really is exceptional anyway. The cylinder gap is the distance from the forcing cone here to the front of the cylinder. And this one has um, a really good, I guess it should be six to ten, uh, maybe five to nine thousandths of an inch, four to eight thousandths, somewhere around there in the four to eight thousandths for that space. If you hold it up to the light and look through, you'll see a little gap. Sometimes the hand will push up and it'll be a little bit tighter, a little bit shorter when it's ready to go, like this, hammer cocked. Alright, so that's the cylinder gap. For disassembly, uh, there's a side plate with screws and one under here that the side plate will come out. Be very careful if you ever do that because the internal parts um, can be um, pulled out of the gun and very difficult to put back together. And also, the, um, the machining of the side plate to the gun, you could barely even see the line there of where it, it, um, and it goes all the way from here, around here, and all the way around here. And then the machining is so well done in the stainless steel that if you try to pry that out, you could actually distort the metal a little bit and then it won't go back in the same way. So there's certain ways to do that. So this is a good compromise between carryability and durability. Um, the Ruger Red Hawk weighs a lot more and it's just a big chunky beast of a pistol. Just a little bit more carryable for hunting or in the field. Self-defense is probably not that applicable even though a big person could probably do it. But the 44 Magnum has so much blast, so much blinding um, a blast sometimes uh, for nighttime that it's not the greatest for self-defense. It might be blinded after a few shots plus what's coming out of the cylinder gap. You can get self-defense ammo that minimizes that. But still, with the recoil and the blast, follow-up shots are difficult at best in certain situations. So it's really um, a hunting gun or other uses for the 44 uh, Magnum. Home defense, I could see it in 44 specials with um, uh, paying attention to certain uh, self-defense 44 special ammo. You could probably uh, get a nice compromise between uh, self-defense capabilities and the muzzle blast and the flash that would go along with that. Extraction here is when you push this up, the star extractor will bring the empties out. So you turn it upside down, strike that a few times, and all the empties will come out. And then you're ready to load up again with that. Um, I didn't mention it yet, but this is the end frame. The end frame is the largest, one of the larger frames. I think the 500 Smith & Wesson is, is in the even larger frame. It might be called a Z. Someone could correct me if you want. I can't remember, but it's, uh, it's even larger. But this is the end frame, the largest one they had for quite a while. 
and then the uh, L frame is smaller than that, and then the K frame is smaller still, and the J frame is like the chief special, the, the smallest that they have. So that's a different uh, frame size. It's a 357 model 27 that comes in an N frame, and that's exceptionally strong. Um, <clears throat> Of course, the 44 Magnum and the Model 29, 29 was um, popularized in the Dirty Harry movies that came out in 1971, the first one. And once that came out, people really discovered the uh, 44 Magnum, and there was immediately a run on uh, Model 29 revolvers, and the price jumped way up. So what was a uh, $300 gun, I think, was uh, a $600 gun, $650. I was trying to get one at the time, but in the early 70s, $650 was a lot of money, you know, because um, I don't know, I think the, uh, I think it was $2.50 was the minimum wage back then. So extremely difficult um, to acquire one. I, I didn't, wasn't able to until much later. So that really popularized the, the most powerful handgun in the, in the world. And then in the 1980s, uh, Sledgehammer was a parody from 84 to 86, and it was a really funny show. And it kind of was a dirty, it was a dirty, um, hairy, uh, Callahan type of a character on Sledgehammer with David Roche as the main character and he carried a model 629 six inch and um, if you can get a hold of the show it's just very very funny and, um, and you'll see this gun and actually the model 629 he had I believe it was a six inch and he had plastic grips a polymer type grip that looked like ivory and it had a picture of a sledgehammer on the uh, on the uh, on the grips on both sides so that was really a fun show if you ever can get a hold uh, watch that. Okay, now the pros and cons. Uh, it's um, really nice sights. The sights are really easy to see. It's in stainless steel, so it's very durable. So if you're doing a survival gun, this thing can handle just about anything you want to do, and it's in the durable stainless steel finish, and it's pretty strong. You can shoot a lot of rounds before you get frame stretching and stuff quite a bit. Uh, not like a Ruger Red Hawk, but very durable. Easy, this is the round butt, so you can change grips, a lot more uh, grip options. It's kind of a, it's kind of an elegant gun as well. Unlike the Red Hawk, which is a big tank of a gun, so I like that about it. The trigger is exceptional for target shooting or for getting rounds on target. Just a really great. Uh, another pro is it's got uh, more weight up front because it has uh, the full underlug, adds a little bit more weight here, and also for recoil control, a little more weight. Uh, the cons is probably the weight as well. A person is carrying this all day, you know, you're looking at uh, almost three pounds loaded. Um, shooting really heavy 44 magnums, probably thousands of rounds, you're going to start getting stretching of the frame, you're going to get some, you know, where it's going to have to be sent back, where Red Hawk, it probably is not going to have that. Um, the grips here is probably a con. The back strap it really whacks you good. 44 special is not a problem at all, but the 44 Magnum that's uh, that's going to whack you good, especially on that 250 grain one I showed you. Uh, that one there is um, is pretty brutal for uh, shooting one hand or two hands even. You know it's going to it's going to get you good. <clears throat> um, just to shot this gun too uh, compared to my autos is just extremely accurate. Um, all these Smith & Wessons with the with a really great double and single action, they can't compare to most autos in my mind, except maybe a 9 to 11 um, for the single action especially. So, fun gun, awesome gun, powerful gun. This is one of my favorites in the collection, and it's an exceptional shape. I bought this used not too long ago, and um, really love this revolver. It's just an um, amazing work of art. And for somebody on a ranch or something, or survival against bears and stuff, this is good bear medicine. I mean, this will handle the job. Just great all around. Just a beautiful revolver. Model 629. This is the 629-5. So this is um, my pick of the week for survival gun and 44 Magnum. All right, I hope you enjoyed this review, and thanks for watching Survival Guns, and um, I'll talk to you soon.